This is a project with the single objective of raising the incomes of rural Rwandans. And uh, to do that, we have uh, targeted the specialty coffee sector because we know that uh, the, with 500,000 coffee farmers in Rwanda and an average family size of seven, that anything that we could do to increase the price of coffee would actually affect the livelihoods of one half of the population of Rwanda. 500,000 farmers were processing coffee in 500,000 different ways. The common denominator there is always going to be poor quality. The challenge was, well, gee, with so many different farmers, how are we going to organize it to produce a quality product? Uh, so the, the answer to that was the centralized coffee washing station. We are able to sort, select, and purchase only high-quality cherries. So we can see a good, ripe, turgid red cherry is a high-quality cherry, okay? So that's, that's the big difference. That's why a washing station immediately raises the, the quality of the, the coffee coming from the fields. When you do that, you're you, you setting yourself up for the highest uh, price uh, available on the market. The coffee quality itself is just so high, it's so unique in its character that it is has become sought after. So as soon as we exposed it or unveiled the true quality of the coffee, the specialty coffee industry picked it up immediately and started to source uh, high quality coffees out of Rwanda. And uh, of course they're paying top dollar for it and that top dollar makes it back to the farmer which is what it's all about. The whole object was to put Rwanda on the specialty coffee map. But before you can do that you have to do a lot of other things. You have to link Rwanda and Rwanda coffee to the specialty coffee market. Uh, how to get those 500,000 farmers meeting the demanding quality specifications of this market. That was a tall order. Somehow though, for some, for a lot of reasons, the stars just seem to be aligned in Rwanda. You know, the government uh, of Rwanda, very progressive, very dynamic. They created this 2020 vision with ICT at the forefront. They were made uh, this coffee objective, a national priority. The institutions in the coffee sector uh, immediately uh, grabbed hold of this vision and started to move very clearly and very strongly to work hard to make this happen. And even the fact that international coffee prices were actually at the lowest level was an, uh, uh, led to uh, uh, you know, raising the incentive uh, for the coffee farmer to, do, to change and improve that product, make the higher quality so that they could get more money. That worked also in the favor of uh, Rwanda. Despite that, uh, something was wrong, you know, something was wrong. I'm, I'm an agronomist. As Jack said, and I was living in a veritable coffee paradise. Everything was great. The altitudes, the rainfall, the soils, everything was perfect, but I was drinking coffee from hell. Something was wrong. This coffee tasted really god-awful. I couldn't figure it out what's going on. So we took several Rwandans, uh, my colleagues, the agronomists, Ministry of Agriculture, cooperatives, farmers, and we went to Kenya, Nicaragua, and other countries to see exactly how these countries were meeting these market specifications that Rwanda seemed to be so far away from. And we found a foundational uh, missing link, which was this famous coffee washing station. Uh, you know, a coffee washing station is nothing more than a processing center. It takes the red, ripe cherries, as you saw in that video, from the coffee tree and turns them into an exportable product. And that's one thing that was missing because they were doing things in 500,000 different ways and it resulted in very, very poor quality. So we put the first coffee washing station into place in a place called Maraba in 2002 and we were able with a lot of interventions from the tree all the way to the coffee washing station to produce 30 tons of coffee that made the grade to be sold on the specialty uh, market one to community coffee in Louisiana the other to union hand roasted coffee in London and they receive, these farmers receive over two times the price that any other Rwandan was receiving for their coffee. And bam, it was a huge success and this success resonated throughout the country. You didn't need any news media or anything like that. The grapevine works just fine there. And uh, now the entire, everybody in the country wanted in on this action. 
So as you can see, indeed, uh, uh, Maraba was a big success. It was benefiting thousands of farmers. So now you can see here on the map uh, Maraba in red, uh, but the question was how to scale it up at the nation level and to have hundreds of thousands of farmers benefit from that uh, success. And uh, the question was also but where to put those coffee washing stations, where to put these hundreds of new coffee washing stations in this uh, country. The, uh, in, uh, on the map you can see the green area, it's uh, the coffee growing region in Rwanda. So you can see there was plenty of space to be able to put new one. Uh, it was also the question of how to avoid competition between uh, that everybody wanted a coffee washing station, so the success, uh, everybody wanted to find his own place, so how to uh, be able to regulate and guide this process. How to have also entrepreneurs ready to invest hundreds of thousand dollars into coffee washing station to make sure that they will have a return on investment and uh, benefit the farmer, but also in an environmental sound manner. So this is where, uh, with uh, this famous uh, new GIS team that uh, was looking for uh, uh, to test the tools, uh, we uh, decided to uh, to be able to help and enfin, we we uh, help the process of decision making for this uh, siting of coffee washing station and starting with uh, Maraba. So. Let me uh, zoom in uh, Maraba district. And so we work, uh, the GIS team work with uh, the agronomies, the technician of the coffee project, but also they, um, uh, we work also with the farmer at the cooperative. As you see here, this is a coffee uh, washing station, the first one of the first cooperative of Maraba wanted to put new one. So we, um, we work with them to be able to determine the different parameters that we have to look for to be able to locate new sites. And so this is how we, uh, we, we look at uh, that the coffee washing station should uh, be a near major coffee growing area. It had to be outside of an existing coffee washing station. It needs to be close to road, to close to water, but also uh, not near national park and uh, have sufficient space also to be able to, uh, to uh, have the buildings. When you look at the result um, in Maraba, so this model is based on macro and more on vector base. So you can see here in brown the different areas that we were um, suggesting for the farmers. But then we uh, refine the model and use more uh, raster-based approach, we call the micro model, uh, to be able to uh, look at other parameters, like for example, uh, the springs need to be need, needed to be higher uh, than the site to allow gravity to bring the water to the coffee washing station. Thus, to uh, avoid uh, using electricity or other uh, costly uh, means of uh, bringing power to the, to the site. So when you look at the result, here is a micro, micro <laughs> site selection model, then the combine. So the greener, the better. So there was two major uh, potential suitable sites that we were uh, recommending. So the cooperative members did uh, trust uh, our uh, power, technological power. Huh? And uh, so they did build, uh, after 204, two new coffee washing stations that you can see here that were indeed in those, in those suitable areas. They are still uh, very uh, functional today and uh, uh, having a, a lot of uh, uh, impact on, on the life of those uh, cooperative members. So so the, now the next step was to take it to the national level, um, macro model, micro model, and then combine. So here you can see now at the national level where we were recommending the cooperative or in private investor to build new coffee washing station. And uh, indeed, it went very fast. And I can show you now how it happened in, uh, the sp in 10 years uh, time. So here is uh, now the coffee washing station in time and space. So you see that uh, after 204, there was really a great increase in coffee washing station creation, and then a little bit more less after 2007. In fact, uh, today there is 200 coffee washing stations that has been built. Uh, so in 10 years, so you can see uh, the impact. Uh, and uh, it means that 50% of the coffee production is processed through those coffee washing stations, meaning the increase uh, of coffee quality, and also it means a lot of job for the people working at the coffee washing station. Yeah, by, by 2004, really, Rwanda was on a roll. They were selling coffee now to the US, to Japan, and to Europe 
on the specialty coffee market. But the coffee still wasn't, you know, it wasn't like blow your socks off awesome. It, it just wasn't, it didn't have that consistency to keep going to get the buyers coming back and being really, really happy with the product. There was something else going on and it makes a lot of sense when you think about it. It had only been two years, three years since this whole thing started. There was a lot of things not done and uh, most of that was all about training. A lot of snags along the supply chain, poor management, quality controls were not put into place, just a whole lot of things. Uh, that the, 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 the main thing that was missing was the fact, first of all, that Rwandans don't drink coffee. There was no coffee culture. Uh, as a result, and as anything, you know, if you, if, if you don't know what the product is, you don't know what the quality is, if you don't know how to measure it, you're certainly not going to be able to improve it. And this was the, the big thing. So uh, we, uh, we worked very, very uh, hard on trying to fix this problem so that we could increase prices. And uh, the way we did that was, was through bringing uh, coffee buyers into the country. The coffee market had changed. The way it generally works is that uh, coffee is bought by huge companies and then it is imported into or exported out of those uh, uh, countries and imported into the U.S. And uh, then it is distributed to roasters. But things had changed. Starbucks and others, uh, they started to source coffee directly. And this led to a huge opportunity uh, for Rwanda by linking the specialty market directly to the Rwandan growers and cooperatives that were producing the coffee. So we were able to utilize coffee expert from the U.S. coffee industry to train the Rwandans in evaluating coffee, which is called coffee cupping. It's kind of like wine tasting and to uh, increase their business skills and to put in the quality controls that were necessary. And all along the time, the, the Rwandans were cupping, they were tasting the product, they were able to understand exactly why the coffee was tasting better and therefore they could get a better price. At that point, and this is about 2008, Rwanda became a sought after specialty coffee origin. And then m uh, many coffee companies were keeping Rwanda coffee in and it had created a brand all by itself. Rwanda coffee equals good coffee. Kind of like the Juan Valdez thing from many, many years ago, the Colombian coffee. So that was um, an incredible um, achievement uh, for Rwanda. In fact, it was the first time ever a country was able to ascend to those kinds of heights in the specialty coffee industry in such a short, short time. So we started to say, well, you know, why stop here? with Rwanda's quality, potential, and the drive of the government and the whole, um, all the actors in this coffee sector, we could probably achieve even higher prices if we were able to differentiate that good brand of Rwanda into smaller brands of higher, higher quality, more unique, better tasting coffees, kind of like the wine sector did. You know, you pay a, pri a premium pot price for a French wine, a Bordeaux, for example, and you pay it because that Bordeaux wine has a set of taste attributes that come from the terroir in which it was created that make you come back. It's dry, it has tannic uh, acid, and these are things that people want. And the, the smaller you go down into the Bordeaux region, and into smaller terroirs, the more unique that product becomes and the higher the price you will pay for it. So we figured, well, why not attempt this Appalachian development with uh, Rwandan coffee? And this was, a, this was a new thing. This is uh, some uh, Guatemala and Colombia have played uh, with it to some extent, but this was the first time that we would actually utilize GIS and some other higher technologies to try to create uh, Rwandan Appalachians. The very first thing that needed to be done was to verify that Rwanda possessed a plethora of unique and desirable taste profiles. I mean, it's one thing to be unique, it's another thing to be desirable, but when you put those two together, you create an incredible market opportunity, and this is what we tried to do. How to go about it? That was a different story. Uh, we brought in to Rwanda what's known as, in the coffee world, the cup of excellence. The 
Cup of Excellence is a very prestigious coffee competition. It is like the Coffee Olympics. And we brought that to Rwanda, where many different coffee experts, buyers, tasters, come into、uh, a country and evaluate all the coffees there to select the best、uh, of what they have. Once we took the best、uh, coffees that Rwanda produced, the next, the next part was to correlate those taste attributes. That were detected by these panelists, these coffee experts, correlate those taste attributes with the geographic variables from the places where the coffee was produced, and therefore try to get a certifiable appellation, just like the wine world. And this is where Michelle's going to run us through some of the technology and the general approach we used. In,、uh, in developing these appellations. And so you're going to be able to see here these famous、uh, eight、uh, coffee winners of the Cup of Excellence 2007.、Uh, we had to、uh, work as a multidisciplinary team of geographers, agronomists, socio economists, but also a, a new、uh, area of expertise that、uh, also was a, a new thing that. We were not really、uh, familiar with, which was a cupping specialist. He's the one who was coming with this、uh, scary spider diagram and、uh, with his taste、uh, unique profile for each of the coffee washing stations. And as you can see, we had to deal with、uh, 20, 30 variables of fragrance, aroma, taste, flavor, mouthfeel, finish that uh, we had no uh, really uh, clue uh, uh, with some of the attributes he was talking about, like linden and、uh, how many、uh, Rwandan had、uh, taste an apricot. So,、uh, okay, we had to,、uh, to be able to,、uh, to get that. But、uh, our goal was, re was really indeed uh, to uh, link uh, the taste to space. So, What we did is that we,、uh, we went into our database and started to play with all the geoprocessing tools that were available in the, so in the software to be able to interpolate、uh, a number of key environmental variables that explain, could explain taste. So here you can see that、uh, we had、uh, data、uh, on precipitation in Rwanda. We had also temperature,、uh, among other、uh, meteorological、uh, variables that we were、uh, dealing with. Also, soil is an important、uh, factor that explains taste. So, we had organic matter. And then, when we zoom in a specific service area of those coffee washing stations where the coffee lost,、uh, lo <laughs> lot, sorry, <laughs> the coffee lot were coming from,、uh, then you can see how、uh, soil pH, for example, at the variability of soil pH in, in, a, in, a, terroir, in a service area of the coffee washing station. So, we,、uh, we extract all these、uh, key environmental variables and then、uh, Uh, take, took all the taste、uh, variables and g i v e that to the statistician so he can do his principal component analysis. So we are very anxious with the result because we wanted to have good result at, or at least promising result to, so we can move further into the analysis. So when the result came,、uh, we were quite happy because first we were able indeed to make a link between taste and space for at least three coffee washing stations. So, for example, here in the north,、uh, this is、uh, Muyongwe, which is a coffee、uh, lot coming from the north region, was、uh, really dominant, dominated by black currant and walnut flavor. But not only we were able to make、uh, that link, but also we were able to make a link between a, a specific taste variable and a specific environmental variable. So, let's look again at the Look again at this uh, North uh, uh, region、um, uh, coffee lot.、Uh, so, in fact, the walnut and the red currant were explained more by high altitude and high rainfall. So, this was very important for us. So, the next step was really to map the taste,、uh, to do like the wine industry, you know, then you have, a, a daily, you have really a clear boundary where you know this is where this is a unique taste that will be there for every year, for, forever. So, using environmental cluster analysis,、uh, we cut uh, uh, those uh, tastes in space and add,、uh, and you can see here, a map of those, those unique、uh, boundaries of taste. So, now the question is is it uh, really uh, true? Uh, does those、uh, tastes are really、uh, linked to those space? So, this is uh, where uh, a team right now is working on, uh, on, 
on the ground, collecting a, a lot of data and test uh, valid if we can validate this uh, model in uh, the service area of the North Huye uh, region. And so in, in red here, you can see the boundaries of the service area and in, um, in a surface area, in more brown, you can see the unique uh, environmental cluster. And so trying to test indeed if the taste is, can be mapped uh, in those boundaries. Two months ago, uh, we took this North Hue profile and we sent it to 20 coffee companies in the US uh, in a market survey, asking those coffee companies basically two, two main questions. Okay, first, are you able to identify uh, the profile of this coffee? One, and the answer was yes, you're right on. And this is the fourth year that this has been going on, so we've got the real thing in our hands. And two, will you, are you interested in paying a premium? And the answer was yes, we are interested in paying a premium for this coffee of 25, 35 cents per pound if you can uh, you know, get it to us on a consistent basis and this profile holds up. So we're moving there and this is, this is, this is great news. I think uh, within the next two or three years, we'll have our first uh, Rwandan Appalachian. Uh, and I hope that you'll be looking for that on your supermarket shelves. <laughs> uh, but let's get back to the bigger story here and uh, talk about what happened over these 10 years. And you can just see, you can just sum it up uh, very, very easily here. You know, hundreds of thousands of rural Rwanda families are making six times, six times more money than they were today than they did in 2000 through this uh, coffee sector. And yeah, it, it is true. And the, 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 the most beautiful thing about it is that that income, and we verified this, has gone into putting kids into schools, buying those kids school supplies, getting the family health care. Education. Yeah. And education and, and basically allowing them to improve their own lives. And when you think about it, it's really what it's all about. It's really what we are all about, is trying to do what we do to make other people happy. And uh, we've been honored to do stuff. So. <laughs>